Which one is better for your health, sugar or bread? The official dietary guidelines say that both are perfectly okay as long as you limit your sugar to less than 10% of calories and half of the bread you eat is whole grain. But then there are others who say that that's not true, that complex carbs like bread is just another form of sugar. So which one is it? Today we're going to talk about all the different factors that you need to understand to make better decisions about sugar and bread, whether it's white or whole grain, so that you can safely navigate in the oceans of myths and misinformation. Coming right up. Hey, I'm Dr. Ekberg. I'm a holistic doctor and a former Olympic decathlete. And if you want to truly master health by understanding how the body really works, Make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss anything. So the first thing a lot of people think of, and people say that carbohydrates are essential because of blood sugar, that the body needs blood sugar for energy. And when the blood sugar is low, the fastest way to bring it up is to eat something sugary. So let's talk about blood sugar. There's something called glycemic index. And a lot of people say that, well, sugar has a high glycemic index, it raises blood sugar quickly, but complex carbs are different. That bread, especially whole grain bread, is very different. It's much, much slower. So let's look at the numbers. The glycemic index of table sugar, of sucrose, is 65, and the glycemic index of white bread is 75. So white bread is actually a lot higher than sugar. Well, how about whole grain? That's supposed to be slower, right? Well, whole wheat bread is 74. So there's one point difference between white and wheat, and they're both about 10 points higher than sugar. So they raise blood sugar faster than pure sugar. And these are numbers from a place called health.harvard.edu. You're going to get different numbers. They're going to be up or down five or ten points depending on whose study you look at. And we also want to understand about glycemic index that it's a very rough estimate because it depends on the person, it depends on their insulin resistance, it depends on their age, on their activity level, and it depends on what else you ate together with it. Okay, Most people don't eat these things by themselves, but it still gives us a really good idea about how this works. So how can a complex carb have a higher glycemic index? How does that work? So we need to understand just a little bit about how these look at as a molecule. So table sugar, sucrose, is a disaccharide. It has two sugars, two monosaccharides, two rings of sugar hooked together. One is called glucose and one is called fructose. And the glucose has a glycemic index of 100. That's how they define glycemic index. The 100 is the baseline, so to speak. But fructose is much, much slower. It's only 15. So it takes a little bit of time to split this up and then you sort of take the average roughly. So that's just a ballpark to give you an idea of how the body ends up responding at about a level of 65. Even though starches are complex, they are much, much longer chain, it doesn't take the body very long to start breaking it up. And the breakdown of starch, starch consists of amylose, and amylopectin. And the breakdown of these start already in the mouth. We have something called salivary amylase. And that's an enzyme in the mouth that starts breaking down carbohydrates, starches, in the mouth even before we have swallowed anything. So the breakdown starts very, very quickly. And then once these long chains, these complex carbs, are broken down, which happens in minutes, then they're broken off in little pieces of two. They're broken down in disaccharides. The sugar is called maltose. Two glucoses fit together is called maltose. And then from there, it doesn't take very long before an enzyme called maltase 
It's going to break up that disaccharide and now we have two glucose molecules each which has a glycemic index of 100. So the response is not going to be 100 because it's going to take a few minutes to break this up and start the process but in the end that is why because it's so fast to break these up that in the end the total result the glycemic index of complex carbs can be higher than that of pure sugar. So from a blood sugar perspective both of these are disastrous because they raise blood sugar very very quickly and when blood sugar goes up very very quickly it's going to come down very quickly. So you're creating a blood sugar roller coaster and the result is very often hypoglycemia and this is when you feel weak and unfocused and irritated and lack of energy and you get cravings and now of course you hear that blood sugar is a good thing we got to raise blood sugar and you go eat something sugary or you go have a piece of bread and now you're back on that roller coaster. The next factor I would want to look at is about GMOs that both sugar and bread today are very very unnatural. Cane sugar is okay it's not a GMO but most other sugar which is the majority of sugar and high fructose corn syrup in the world come from beet sugar and corn and those are both GMOs. So most of the sugars are going to be GMO today. And even though wheat per se isn't officially classified as GMO it's only because they didn't have the sophistication of gene splicing of inserting individual genetic traits and genetic sequences into the molecule. So back when they were hybridizing, when they were developing wheat in the second half of the 1900s, they didn't have that technology. But the end result is pretty much the same because what they did is they hybridized them. They combined different species of wheat, different strains of wheat, and now they ended up with new products, with new strains. And why is that important? Because thousands of years ago there was only one type of wheat. And by the time the Egyptians came around there were two types of wheat. And then it took thousands of years before they had anything more. They were called emmer and einkorn. But then when they started hybridizing these things, so humans had thousands of years to get used to a very very limited number of wheats where the proteins were the same over and over and over and over. It was the same type of food we were exposed to. But then from 1950 and on they hybridized it thousands of times and each time they hybridize it they bring in the parent strains and they create a new strain. Then the offspring can have 5% of the proteins that neither of the parents had. So for every generation of hybridization we can get 5% new proteins. And in one study they found 14 new kinds of gluten proteins from a single hybridization. And that they've done this thousands of times and that means that the protein types have virtually nothing in common with the grains, with the wheats that humans have been exposed to for thousands of years. So whether those were okay or not, they have virtually nothing in common with the type of wheat that we're eating today. Today, the wheat has about 12% protein, whereas the ancient wheats like einkorn had about 28%. So we've changed They've hybridized it to make white bread, to make fluffy bread, to give it shelf stability and to increase the yield. And one of the greatest reasons that they worked so hard on hybridizing was that it was a staple for a starving world. So they have indeed solved a lot of feeding the world problems by developing wheat with a higher yield. But it came at the cost of not ever testing to see if this was safe and doing it at breakneck speeds and developing all these different proteins that we don't really know how humans react to. And today what we see is that one of the most common allergies that there is in mankind is that to wheat.
So both sugar and wheat are very, very foreign to what was on the planet thousands of years ago. And we don't really know yet. We, we know that people get sick quite a bit, but we really have no idea how far reaching these effects are. Next is vitamins. And sugar is a pure crystallized form of carbohydrate. It has nothing else in there. It is 100% carbohydrate crystals, which means it has no B vitamins, it has no minerals, and vitamins and minerals are necessary for us to metabolize these. Okay, so when you eat sugar, you get calories. In order for you to convert that sugar into energy, it requires B vitamins and minerals. And if it doesn't come with the sugar that you eat, the body has to borrow it. It has to steal it from someplace else. So you have a little bit of B vitamins and you have some minerals in the body from a time when you ate some real food and you have a little bit of reserves, but every time that you eat sugar, you steal from those reserves and you're depleting yourself. So this is one of the primary mechanisms for nutritional deficiencies. Much the same thing holds true for bread, but here is one of the main differences that bread is not as bad as sugar when it comes to vitamins and minerals because bread does have some. Now in white bread, they pretty much strip all the nutrients away, but then they add some of them back. They do what's called fortified. And one way of thinking about that is like if you give me a dollar and then I give you a penny back, then I have fortified you. So that's kind of what they do. They take away hundreds of nutrients and they put back a few. And the ones they put back are synthetic. They're isolated forms. They're not the complex versions that nature put there in the first place. So even if it's fortified, it's still going to be deficient. And here's also the primary difference between whole wheat and white bread because even if white flour is a little bit better than sugar whole wheat flour is a lot better than white flour because it does have not just the starchy portion but it has the fiber and it has the germ which contains some good essential fatty acids some natural complex e vitamins and some minerals and so forth the next factor we want to look at is how does it affect immune function so both sugar and bread both sugar and starch because starch breaks down very quickly into sugar they both feed all the enemies in your body so anything that you don't want in your digestive tract such as yeast fungus bacteria and parasites they live primarily off sugar they don't do nearly as well on protein and fat so when you eat sugar or starches then you're selectively feeding the bacteria all the life forms that you don't want and that starts upsetting your biome your gut flora the population of bacteria in your gut and when that gets imbalanced now you're more likely to get gas and bloating and leaky gut and allergies and so forth and then there's the issue of immune reactions to the food itself so technically it's basically impossible to have an immune reaction to the sugar itself so in that sense the sugar is better than the wheat but you can still have immune reactions to the enemies that you feed when it comes to wheat however it is one of the most common allergens so not only are you feeding the things that you don't want but you're also getting allergies and sensitivities uh, primarily from the gluten but there are other components in there it's not just the celiacs there's today there's hundreds of different kinds of gluten and celiacs is just one of those so even if you don't get the severity of a celiacs reaction you can still have an immune reaction to all those different types of gluten and here is also where there's a big difference between white and wheat sugar of course has no fiber white bread has no fiber but whole wheat bread does have some fiber and this fiber can actually be beneficial in helping to balance because it doesn't just feed the the pathogenic bacteria 
it also helps feed the, ba the beneficial bacteria and maintain some kind of balance there. So what about toxicity? The sugar in itself isn't toxic. High doses of sugar makes it toxic. But of course, if we eat organic sugar, then there is no toxin in itself because it is a natural molecule. It's just the concentration that makes it toxic. We still have to be concerned with pesticides if we don't eat organic and of course like we talked about the GMO. But when it comes to bread, now there's many, many, many things that make it not so great. First of all, it's grown with pesticides, things like glyphosate. But then in order to make it wider, to make it more luxurious and appealing, they bleach it. And that also improves the texture of the flour and the baking properties. But then they go further and they add dough conditioners because they want the dough really, really sticky and elastic, kind of rubbery, because that makes for very, very fluffy bread. So then they add the bleach and the dough conditioners. And there's a number of chemicals like benzoyl peroxide and calcium peroxide, calcium bromate, potassium peroxide, potassium bromate. And the list goes on and on and on. And all or most of these chemicals are banned in most other countries. Virtually the entire uh, Southeast Asia and the European Union, as well as many other countries, have banned these substances. But in the United States, we still use them because we like fluffy bread so much. And when we talk about the dose, we also have to understand insulin resistance. And while there are many, many different facets, insulin resistance is probably the greatest single factor that we have to be concerned with. And there's two different ways that you can promote insulin resistance with these foods. The first one is the glycemic index. Anytime that you raise blood sugar dramatically, then you're going to have a strong insulin response. And over time, if you keep adding sugar after you keep having high insulin responses, when you don't have a, a famine period over the winter, when you keep having these foods 365 days a year, three meals a day or more, then you develop insulin resistance. So the blood sugar, the high frequent blood sugar promotes insulin and will drive insulin resistance. But the other way is that fructose, like we talked about here, it's 50% glucose and 50% fructose. And the fructose can only be metabolized by the liver. So if you eat the, even just if you eat the recommended amount of 10% of calories from sugar, you're still getting 25 grams of fructose on top of all the other stuff that you're eating. And fructose can only be metabolized by the liver. So it's like force feeding the liver. It's like overstuffing the liver. And when we talk about the dose, then in small amounts, if you eat organic sugar, and especially if you eat fruit sugar, fructose, in very small amounts, if you kept that under five or 10 grams, then it would be a healthy food because it wouldn't overwhelm the liver. And those are the kind of doses that we would get just by eating seasonal vegetables and fruits. But today, we change the rules when we concentrate them, when we refine the foods. Now we're getting many, many, many times more of that fructose. And that's why fructose, which is sort of a natural thing, would, does become a poison. And this is also why sugar seems to be the straw that breaks the camel's back when it comes to developing insulin resistance and diabetes. Because the blood sugar itself, while it is a strong factor in developing insulin resistance and diabetes, it's not as strong as the fact that fructose clogs up the liver. Because even though the glycemic index of grains is higher than that of sugar, this by itself, grains by itself, is not as strong a promoter of diabetes. A lot of populations will eat grains and rice and bread until, and they'll be fine, until they introduce sugar 
and that kind of tips the scale and they get insulin resistance and diabetes. So there's two factors and if we are insulin resistant we need to limit both. So sugar if you're insulin sensitive could be all right in very small doses. If you ate a teaspoon or two a day then you would probably be all right. I occasionally have one or two pieces of dark chocolate but I eat it somewhere around 80% so I get about one gram of sugar per piece and if I have one or two a day then that is not enough to really do any damage. It's not enough to create insulin resistance or to feed any enemies because it gets absorbed even before it gets down there. When it comes to wheat however then the dose sometimes doesn't matter because if you are sensitive which more and more and more people are then even one bite could set off an immune reaction, a sensitivity that promotes more inflammation, that perpetuates the, the gut imbalances and the leaky gut and the inflammation. So sugar could be okay in small doses, but if you're sensitive, then wheat is not okay in any amount. So these are the things that we need to understand when we talk about if sugar or bread is good or bad because it's different for different people. It's, it depends. Are you overweight? Are you insulin resistant? How active are you? And do you have a sensitivity? Do you have a gut imbalance? So it's not as simple as just looking at the weight and the calories and the glycemic index. We need to understand a little bit more and then we need to put it into practice and start noticing what's happening in our own bodies. Personally, I don't eat wheat. I eat very, very little sugar. But if I were to go back to eating bread at some point, and if you decided to, I would say if you are insulin sensitive and if you know that you have a strong digestion, that you don't have a sensitivity to wheat, then I would find some ancient wheats. I would go back and find some emmer wheat and then I would find it organic. I would grind it myself, I would bake it myself and I would eat the bread fresh. I would freeze the leftovers and I would avoid any of these pesticides and, and any of these issues that we have talked about. If you enjoy this video, you're probably going to get a lot out of that one. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.